Welcome to the sixth annual Max Gray Fellows in Mood Disorders Salon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Laurie Gordon, founder of the Max Gray Fund for Treatment of Mood Disorders and chair of the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. Thank you all for joining us and for your support of the Max Gray Fund. This is one of my happiest days of the year. Since 2014, together we have raised, wait for it, over $1.4 million. That's extraordinary and I couldn't be more proud. While we miss Maxie every day, his legacy lives on through the 18 fellowships and hundreds of patients and families who have received and continue to receive state-of-the-art care in our child and adolescent and adult mood disorder clinics. This afternoon, I'm so happy to welcome some of Maxie's friends and our family, along with many people who did not know Max, but are supporting this important work. I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Chancellor Jean and Carol Block for their friendship and encouragement, and to Arlene and Henry Gluck for introducing me to UCLA. I especially want to thank Drs. Gitlin and Miklowitz for their guidance along the way and for training our extraordinary fellows. I also want to thank my good friend, Dr. Tom Strauss and Drs. Maziata and Martin and President Spizo for their unwavering commitment and support. This would not be possible without all of you. Wow, this has been an unprecedented year. COVID-19 has impacted the mental health of all of us. Now, it is more important than ever to expand care and make resources available to those who need them the most. Visits to UCLA psychiatry are up almost 30% and fewer patients are missing their appointments because of the accessibility of telehealth. Last year, the fellows in the Adult Mood Disorders Clinic conducted 667 visits and served almost 200 unique patients. In addition, the Max Gray CHAMP program saw 160 unique patients last fiscal year. That's more than a three-fold increase in just two years and a 350% increase now that the program has three fellows. Since July of 2020, the fellows are on track to double the total visits and patients served from last fiscal year. Think about this. When we started the Max Gray Fund in 2014, there were waiting lists of almost six months for the first intake appointment at CHAMP. With three Max Gray fellows this year and next year, waiting times have been reduced to two to three weeks. Think about what that is doing for our community and the children and adolescents and their families. I couldn't be more proud. Last March, we were lucky to host our salon right before the shutdown. This year, like all other events, we are having our first virtual salon. Actually, we have more attendees than ever, thanks to the convenience of Zoom. This afternoon, I am delighted to moderate a conversation with our 2021 Max Gray Fellows, and I'm so excited for you to meet them. Megan Ichino Se, Kirthin Somaineth, Glenna Smith, and Cassidy Zanko. We will be answering questions that you submitted in advance of this event. Then we will have the opportunity to hear from a former patient a brilliant young woman, Camille, who will share her inspiring story. So now I'll turn to my remark, our remarkable fellows. Um, each of you decided to specialize in behavioral health. Was there a particular reason or a moment that psychology or psychiatry became your career choice and what brought you to UCLA? Megan, let's start with you. 
Thanks so much, Lori, for the introduction. And I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Um, I wouldn't say that there was like one particular moment, but rather a number of moments across college that really led me to pursue clinical psychology. I think I first got hooked on psychology after taking one of those really large intro courses as a freshman. And then I just was very fortunate to get involved in some psychology research on campus where I really first became exposed to the whole process of academic science and just became intrigued by being able to design and implement experiments to better understand these complex um, cognitive and emotional processes in humans. And then I became very interested in serious mental illness in particular, both through my coursework, um, but also through some firsthand experiences volunteering, particularly with an organization working with homeless youth in Chicago and just witnessing through those experiences how much serious mental illness impacted our community, um, I was really inspired to work in this area. So when I learned about clinical psychology as a profession, um, I felt that I'd found a career that both met my desire to connect empathically with others and help others while still being able to really further that scientific understanding of mental health and find better treatments for this population. Um, and in terms of coming to UCLA, it was my first choice for my pre-doctoral internship, which is kind of like a mini residency for clinical psychologists, um, and was also my first choice for fellowship, um, mainly because UCLA offers such amazing specialized training um, in the treatment of adolescent serious mental illness, both in diagnosis um, and in treatment. Wow, that's terrific. Yeah. Kirsten, let's go to you. I know you've had an interesting path an engineer, an anesthesiologist, and now a psychiatrist. How did you discover your passion and find your way to UCLA? Thanks for the intro, Lori. Um, yeah, I, I definitely didn't have a direct path into uh, psychiatry. And after college, I started working as a software engineer, um, got interested in neuroscience after working with one of the company's clients. And that led me to a behavioral neuroscience lab for a couple of more years and then to medical school. Um, in medical school, went back and forth uh, between psychiatry and anesthesia. And of course, those are on opposite sides of the spectrum when it comes to the day-to-day -day life in those specialties. Um, but I had academic interests in both and I ended up choosing anesthesia um, at the end of medical school and about two years into residency training wow. um, <laughs> is uh, when I realized I should have picked psychiatry. And that's mostly because I wanted long-term relationships with patients as opposed to um, the touch and go interactions that you get in the, in the operating room. And uh, how I ended up at UCLA, well, fortuitously enough, um, there were two spots that opened up that year that I was interested in, in switching out of anesthesia. Um, and I interviewed for that position with Dr. Spar, who was the previous program director, uh, got a contract a week later and then moved to Los Angeles in June of 2017. Um, fast forward to my third year of residency where I did mood clinic at the VA, um, really enjoyed that and followed that up with mood disorders clinic under the supervision of Dr. Michael Gitlin for my fourth and final year of residency. Um, it was pretty clear to me at this point that I really enjoyed treating mood disorders. Um, and I got the opportunity, thanks to you, Lori, um, to do yet another year in the Mood Clinic through the, the Max Gray Fellowship. Um, I'm immensely grateful to you for this experience because it's allowed me to learn so much and also continue care for my now relatively large panel of patients I've had for almost two years now. Oh, that's wonderful. I know Cassidy's going to talk about continuity of care later, so I won't jump into that. Um, Glenna, tell us about your story and how did you end up um, at UCLA? Of course. Thanks, Lori. I went to medical school to be a pediatrician. Um, I knew I wanted to work with kids, but I didn't know that it was in this capacity for a while. And I think I learned over time that psychiatry is this special field in medicine where you really get to know people, like Kirthen said, where your job is to listen and sort of understand someone's world instead of sort of focus on their asthma or a broken arm. And um, if you're lucky, like at Champ and like in the Max Gray Fellowship, you're really given the time to do that. And getting to know people in our field is often sort of the most important intervention, especially younger people, um, when you really sort of have the opportunity to shift the trajectory of the li their lives or help them and their families work towards that. Um, and that's what brought me here, both to the field and to UCLA. I came out here for um, my Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship training. And like Kirthen, I loved the Mood Disorders Clinic um, with Dr. Miklowitz and Dr. Horseman. Um, 
and all of the great attendings in that program. And I am, I'm grateful to you also for getting to stay and do more of this um, and, and really sort of evolve in my training um, in a place that really puts a premium on treating patients and their families. Patients first. That's what, that's what Joni Spizo says. Um, Cassidy, we're so glad you're with us again for your third year as a Max Gray Fellow. Um, many of you may remember Cassidy from last year's salon when she shared her personal story about choosing this field as her brother was facing some pretty difficult struggles. Um, Cassidy has allowed me to share that she got married this past year and she just had a baby. So she's on maternity leave, but she's joining us. Um, as you reflect back on your three years as a Max Gray Fellow, what have you learned about continuity of care? Thanks, Lori. Um, it's truly been such an honor and amazing learning experience to be a part of this program for three years now. Um, I've really had continuity of care in two different ways um, because of this team, which I consider kind of a family now. Um, I've had continuity with the patients, of course, and then the incredible team of mentors and teachers from Dr. Miklowitz, Dr. Hortzman, Dr. Marvin, Dr. Sedith, just, and, and the other fellows. So with patients, I think that I've learned the most that just how valuable time is um, especially with children and teens, like um, Glenna alluded to, you know, they are moving targets in regards to their diagnosis and their treatment plans since they're still developing at such a fast rate at these ages. Um, and Camille and, and her family I know are on tonight and, and are a perfect example of the benefit of time as you will all hear yourselves later today. Um, for me, it has been a really good reminder and learning and trying not to rush treatment process and to be present with families where they are right now in the moment and not push them where I think they need to be. Um, and then with the team here, I think continuity has allowed me to you know, hone my diagnostic skills and learn so much through the consultation process with um, more experienced providers. Wow. That's terrific insight. Um, during this past year, we've all had to adapt in countless ways. What changes have emerged during your time as a fellow that you will continue to use in your practice? Kirsten, let's start with you. Well, I, I uh, think all providers, you know, including myself, were, were a bit anxious to see how things were going to shake out um, with patient care when the pandemic hit. Um, and I found that technology really made the transition seamless. Um, and it, it's largely improved patient compliance with appointments, and it's made it easier for so many people that had to drive, you know, a couple hours each way sometimes, depending on where they're coming from. Um, so now and in the future, within my private practice, I'm offering to continue telehealth if it's more convenient, either by phone or video, and, and patients have been really receptive to it, which is great. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, Megan, what positive outcomes have you seen since the pandemic began? Yeah, well, well, first, I just want to echo what Kirithan said about the technology aspect and that this year I was somewhat surprised, but just really thrilled to find that teletherapy can be just as impactful as in, in person therapy. Um, so I think it makes sense to continue providing telehealth options to families who likely can you talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I just think that it makes it so much more accessible, especially in a city like LA, where, you know, getting to the clinic and finding parking, there's already a lot of barriers to entry, um, even apart from just finding access to mental health services. So I think the telehealth um, option is just a really lovely option for families. And, and one example is um, I've worked with a family where a mom, single mom working, has a very unpredictable work schedule. So sometimes she'll zoom into family sessions, like during a break from work. And something like that just wouldn't have been possible before. I don't think this family would have gotten care. Oh, well, that's terrific. That's yeah. wonderful. And then on top of that, um, I think from a training perspective, using telehealth has been just surprisingly easy for getting in vivo or in the moment supervision. 
So pre-pandemic, um, we touched base with supervisors in between therapy sessions or in between assessments, um, or sometimes would even get like text messages or phone calls during a session if we were being observed. Whereas now if I'm doing an evaluation or a therapy session um, and a supervisor is observing me on Zoom, they can just have their camera off and send chats. Um, so it's just much more seamless. And in that way, I think has been a very kind of surprising benefit to the transition to telehealth. Well, that's interesting. Um, Glenna, would you say there's a silver lining? Absolutely. I, you know, I echo what everyone said so far. And, and I think the silver lining for me has really been sort of this new layer of intimacy um, and sort of understanding of patients and families that comes with seeing them in their home environments. Um, I've met countless pets. I've met siblings and family members that might never have made it into the office. And my understanding of patients is richer for it, I think. Um, pets are often my first line of defense when I meet a patient who doesn't want to talk to me or who um, is sort of anxious, upset, and, um, you know, whether it's introducing my dog or meeting their pets, um, it's really helped kind of connect. And those connections have been incredibly meaningful. And like both Kirthan and Megan said, I think this year showed us that we can provide really excellent quality care via telehealth. And that will help people get more care. They, they both said this, but people drive for two or three hours to come to UCLA for appointments sometimes. I think some of us think about sort of how quickly you can get caught up in traffic in LA, but we have people coming from all over Southern California and sometimes as often as once a week to get care. So it's really made a huge difference for those families to be able to use Zoom for care. Well, that's terrific. Um, hope in the face of uncertainty is so important and there's still so much unknown ahead. Megan, are there any coping mechanisms that you would recommend for dealing with the uncertainty that exists right now? Yeah, it's certainly been a year of uncertainty, um, and we know this is a huge driver of anxiety. And of course, there's different ways to handle this. Um, for me, something that's been personally helpful has just to remind myself um, of the best possible scenario or outcome. And I think most people, including myself, um, might naturally jump to those worst case scenarios and maybe even discount the positive outcomes or neutral outcomes. So it can be a helpful reminder to just make room in your head, provide a little additional space for those alternative outcomes instead of letting that worst case scenario dominate. Um, and one kind of trick I'll give to patients too is to just write down those alternatives, just getting them down on paper instead of getting caught up in the spiral of things that could go wrong. And then kind of on top of that and separate from that too, it also can just be helpful to name those thoughts and feelings that you're having about a situation if you're anxious or uncertain. Um, and realizing that a lot of other people are feeling the same way and having the same thoughts and that those are normal um, and that you're not alone in those experiences, especially right now during this time this year when so many things have been out of our control. Um, in your profession, your main goal is to help others. That work can be super stressful. While you provide treatment, during this unprecedented time, what coping mechanisms are you using for yourself? Cassidy, let's start with you. Personally, uh, my number one for me, uh, it's not always easy, I have found with a newborn, um, is moving my body. Um, so getting outside once a day for a walk or stretching in between patients or during naps and um, has been a big key for my personal well-being um, during this time. And then also some form of, of meditation. So either mindfulness or mantra meditation, I know that can almost sound like a daunting word like who has time to go and like meditate all day but sometimes it's as simple Not as all day. <laughs> um like repeating a mantra or what we call like a focus phrase like I have time I have time I have time I have found that if I pick one and I repeat it to myself I can pretty instantly shift my focus and make myself feel a bit more calm so that I can get back on track. And um, so those have been the, the two that have, have worked best for me during, during this time. Megan, is there a tool that you could share with all of us to help us get through this challenging time? Um, 
Well, I think this is it's personal, right? So everyone's going to have kind of specific things that that resonate with them and help them feel relaxed and rested and calm. Something that's been um, really helpful for me is to try and schedule some pleasant activities to look forward to each week um, or sometimes each day if it's that kind of day. Um, sometimes I think like pre-pandemic, we were having a lot of these um, on the fly, pleasant moments with either colleagues and just catching up or maybe like listening to, a, to the radio station you like on your commute or a podcast or something. And some of those experiences may be just less available um, by the shift, you know, in our schedule because of the pandemic now. So I found that I had to be really purposeful and intentional about scheduling in those moments for myself. Um, so some things that I've actually, you know, penciled into my calendar are picking up coffees on Monday mornings from my favorite coffee shop or FaceTiming with my nephews who are toddler age and just like hilarious every time I chat with them. Um, scheduling hikes on the weekends with friends, all of those kind of little pleasant moments that, that kind of keep me going through the week. And so I know I have something to look forward to. Oh, those are really great tips. Thank you. Um, I know we've all felt isolated during the pandemic. I wonder if you've seen changes with your patients who are dealing with loneliness. Um, Kirthen, in your work with adults and Glenna, in your work with kids, um, how do you coach them? Are there any coping mechanisms you can suggest? Kirthen? Sure, yeah, Lori, I've, I've certainly seen um, an uptick in, in the loneliness, loneliness and isolation. Um, and, and just speaking from, you know, my own perspective, when I started feeling more of that, um, I remember one of the things that really helped me was, was exercise. And, you know, I thought that if this is helping me out, let me start to offer some of that advice to my patients. Um, and, and another thing that I realized I needed to do was, was keep a social connection, whether that was through zoom or FaceTime, um, to, you know, to keep seeing friends and family, um, and when Zoom got stale after those first few months, because I just was using it so much, uh, kind of like Cassidy you know, mentioned earlier, I had to start moving. Um, and I started making the effort to get out of the house once a day um, and changing the environment I was in on a daily basis, at least once a day, helped reduce uh, the drag that was a consequence of, of my home life largely blending in with my work life. Um, and I try to just kind of give these tips to some of my patients because they really helped me out. Oh, that's terrific. Glenna, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I have seen a lot of challenges for kids related to social isolation. Um, I think school is so important for kids, right? It's set up to give them positive reinforcement, uh, you know, on age appropriate tasks from teachers, from people who are not your parents and to get some of that reinforcement from your peers also. And I think, um, that's how kids develop their sense of self, their sense of competence, um, and acknowledging that we've lost a lot of that, I think is a really important first step because I have some parents come to me and they're like, I have no idea why my kid is freaking out or regressing or not acting like they were when they were in the normal structure of school. So just sort of putting words to that first and then, and then talking to parents about how important it is to look for and create opportunities for their kids to succeed and to, and to praise them. Yeah, give them praise. I always say, catch your kid being good as often as you can. Don't forget to layer on that praise. They need it. That's helpful. Um, still with you, Glenna. I know we're, it's, we're getting closer, much, much closer now. And we're looking forward to a time when we can move beyond this uncertainty and isolation. As we prepare to re-enter society, do you have specific tools that you can recommend to combat social anxiety for kids who might not be excited about going back or anxious? Yeah, that's a great question. We were just talking about social isolation and while many are missing that social interaction for some of my kids who have social anxiety, the stay at home order has made it worse, has made it more powerful and going back out into the world and and sort of the social demands that come with that are gonna present a major challenge. And in general, the approach is do the thing that makes you anxious when you can. Um, and, but, but you'll really have to sort of start low and go slow. Um, oh, I like that. Let's say that again, start low and go slow. Very absolutely. helpful. 
yeah, you can't just jump into the deep end with these sorts of things. I think many anxious kids will sort of need to build up to their previous levels of social functioning slowly, like going to the park for 10 minutes instead of an hour and sort of slowly building up that time so that they can sort of show themselves they can handle it. That's very helpful. That's great. Um, okay, this is for all of you. Um, between virtual learning, working from home, the impact of social distancing, we've seen new family dynamics emerge. Given these shifts for families and children, what challenges have you been addressing and how have you resolved them? Megan, let's start with you. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest changes I've seen in family dynamics at least is that now each family member has been required to take on so many more roles than pre-pandemic with parents having to be teachers and children having to be more self-motivated um, and adapt to so many new pandemic related rules and changes. And oftentimes people may expect that um, themselves or their family members just continue to operate the, work, the way they were pre-pandemic. I think Glenna was kind of addressing this a bit with parental expectations for kids. Um, but I think for themselves too, right? We might expect ourselves to operate with the same level of efficiency or energy for kids, maybe the same level of academic success, um, even despite taking on these new rules and new stressors. So one thing that comes up a lot when I work with families is just, helping everybody adjust or even relax those expectations for themselves and for each other and to be kind and understanding and empathic of these new demands. Um, so we have a lot of conversations around kind of what's realistic to expect right now and is it okay to let up and just kind of be kind to yourself during this time when we're under a lot of stress. Oh, that's really helpful. Cassidy, what about you? I completely 100% agree with Megan and was going to say something very similar. I think in addition to these new roles, um, families are spending so much more time together in the same space, right? Nearly 24 seven when before they had work or school to give them like a break. Um, so I think it's more important than ever, like Megan said, to set those expectations and talk to each other, talk about them regularly. So during family therapy, um, we recommend a weekly family meeting, right? And during this time, I might actually recommend multiple times a week family <laughs> meetings, um, especially, you know, maybe between parents or couples, um, talking each night about the schedule the next day um, can be really helpful just to all be together and, and, and have that time carved out and on the schedule planned together um, so that, again, that 24-7 time and space can hopefully feel a little bit more manageable. Oh, well, that's really helpful. Um, Glenna, what about you? I agree with, bo with both Megan and Cassidy said. I think sort of this, this is the name of the game, sort of giving yourself some grace, shifting your expectations and sort of taking things one day at a time. I think, um, like Cassidy said, there are a lot of things from family therapy that I think have been able to generalize to a lot of different kinds of families struggling during the pandemic and family meetings, huge piece of that puzzle. I think one of the things that I've noticed is that with that expanded role um, that parents are having to take on as teacher and referee and recess monitor and all those things, there's just more potential for conflict and for negative interaction and kids can experience it as nagging and parents don't like it so much either. It's not so fun for them. And so I've worked with families um, to sort of create something to sort of offset some of those negative interactions. So like Cassidy said, coming up with a plan, like as, as concrete as a physical document you can refer to instead of it being sort of all coming back on mom or dad. And so we've created schedules and checklists and sort of things parents can whip out of their back pockets to, to help kids sort of get a little bit of that structure that they get in school without it having to fall all on mom and dad. Well, that's helpful. Kirsten, with so much to juggle these days, do you have some advice for parents? Sure. And I think everyone on the panel alluded to uh, some of the things I'm about to say. Um, and, I, and I echo the sentiment of managing expectations, um, namely, you know, acknowledging that this is a really unique time for everyone. 
Um, and I think in a society where we're so used to immediate gratification, um, parents can often get caught up in feeling pressure to find immediate solutions for problems when they arise. Um, and this is where I try to reinforce patients, um, whether it's you know with themselves or with other family members. Um, and a, another piece of advice uh, that, that Glenna alluded to, um, in the spirit of schedules, I think parents should try to actively schedule time for themselves. And even though in a busy day it can be challenging, I think it's extremely rewarding when people get to check off things that they enjoy doing. Well, that's very helpful. Um, I'd like to know how all of you are dealing with these long days on Zoom with such intense subject matter. I know I get Zoom fatigue without the usual office distractions and social interactions with colleagues. Um, Megan, how are you dealing with all these long Zoom days? Yeah, Zoom fatigue is real. It's a thing. Um, so for me, a couple of things I think have helped um, and I've realized are more important as this pandemic goes on and we continue working from home. Um, one of those things is just finding time to get outside. I think Cassidy and Kirtan and Glenda, maybe everyone said that at some point today, but I just echo that is that if I've spent the whole day and I haven't gone outside yet, I can tell I'm getting a little stir crazy. So I'll try to just pop out really quick in between meetings and feel the sun. Um, and then additionally, just kind of in terms of work environment, I've just been very lucky to work in this really great team environment at UCLA and at the Champ Clinic where colleagues check in on me and we have regular team meetings and I have supervisors that you know have scheduled meetings with me every week and so I don't feel as isolated or alone and people check in with me both personally how I'm doing and also just how I'm managing um, my caseload and talking through cases and patients I'm working with. And that goes a really long way. Um, Glenna and I even share one of those meetings each week. So it's been lovely to both connect, I think, with colleagues on a personal level of just how everyone's holding up at home, but then also be able to like, you know, decompress and talk more about the cases and the serious matter and, you know, material that comes up with our, with our patients. Of course, of course. Glenna, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think I totally agree. Um, I walk outside my front door and stand on my welcome mat and just get like 90 seconds of sun on my face because I have like five minutes turnaround time between each patient. Um, and that helps. And um, everyone sort of said that movement is a, is a big part of this. And I, I agree. I've sort of gone from fellowship where um, I was walking around between the hospitals and my office and all these other places and now I'm just sitting in a chair all the time. I don't even go to the office. So um, movement, I think, is critical to, to my well-being. Um, but like Megan said, I really rely on my colleagues, on my supervisors, on my peers for some sense of normalcy, from, for some sense of support and a space to sort of process what it's like to be a psychiatrist during this time. Um, I totally look forward to Thursday family therapy supervision with Megan and Dr. Marvin. We got a great thing going over there. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have Dr. Horseman sort of available to me, you know, on a weekly basis, but also she'll drop everything um, in, a, in a moment that I have a question uh, sort of more sporadically or spontaneously. Um, and, and everyone has at CHAMP, I think, has made um, our support as fellows a priority, even though we don't get to sort of run into each other in the hallway or pop into each other's offices with questions. Wow. Cassidy? I'm going to echo a lot of that. But um, the first thing, you know, like both Megan and Glenna said, consultation, consultation. Con I have actually on maternity leave, I still have the links. I've thought of jumping in <laughs> to meet with um, Glenna and Sarah Marvin and Megan because I miss that connection. You know, I think- um, The same connection everybody's missing right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and equally, you know, Dr. Mikulitz has invited me to, you know, one of the benefits of being a, a psychiatrist in this clinic as a fellow has been, I've been able to do both family therapy and medications. So usually, you know, we don't always get the opportunity to do therapy as, as a MD and it's, 
that's been one of you know the greatest gifts I've taken out of this. And consulting with Dr. Mikowitz and the team on Thursdays has been you know invaluable to my learning, but also to my sanity. So I think that's been huge. And then personally, um, you know, I think finding something that generates laughter. So you know, watching oh, laughter. Um, that's good. <laughs> yes, something to break up this year that has sometimes felt like it's been harder to feel naturally like you want to laugh. So watching or connecting with family and friends outside of work and getting that break from just Zooming with patients or pro fellow providers all day. So remembering to call my, my best friends or my mom and making sure I'm, I'm connecting on that personal level has really helped me as well. That's terrific. What about you, Kirthen? Uh, I think one of the things I've done is avoiding Zoom on the weekends. That, that that's what gets me through the next week of of being on my phone or on Zoom all the time. Um, but I will say with um, with Zoom, I do look forward to every Wednesday with with Dr. Gitlin at at seven a.m. Um, it's always fun, kind of having that routine. It's been the same thing that I've had for almost a year and a half now. Um, and another thing that people have mentioned to kind of get me through the week is, is exercise. Um, I, you know, I, I made this uh, WhatsApp thread with one of my friends in Boston where last January we set this up and every week we have to work out at least four times. And if we're not able to, to meet that, we have to pay the other person 20 bucks <laughs> and for accountability. Financial incentives. Exactly. Yeah. And we have both of our spouses on there to, to keep us accountable. And, and that's really helped just being more active uh, for the past year compared to, you know, what I, what I was doing in the past. Oh, that's terrific. Um, we've heard such wonderful ideas from all of you. Can you each share one strategy to emerge from this uncertain time stronger than before? Something that everybody listening today can take home and think about using themselves. Kirthen, we'll go right back to you. Well, my, my main takeaway would be um, transparency and communication. Um, if you're a provider, let your patients know that you're there for them, um, especially during these hard times. If you're a patient, don't be shy um, when, you know, for talking to your mental health provider. If, if we don't know there's a problem, we can't really address it. Um, communicating, communicating effectively leads to, to developing rapport and trust, which I think is one of the most crucial things in our field. Um, an example where this was important to me recently is seeing a patient who presented for their first lifetime manic episode. Um, and without developing trust, I would have had a really tough time doing anything for her in the outpatient setting. Um, the mental health system is unarguably hard for people to navigate. And that's whether you're seasoned or new to it. Um, so Absolutely. Yeah. So stressing open communication and, and listening to patient concerns have really been invaluable in, in developing that trust. Wow. That's very helpful. Megan, do you have a top recommendation? Um, I'll piggyback off of Kirthin's comment about good communication. Um, because for many, the pandemic has really caused us to spend a lot more time with people we live with. <laughs> um, which has really upended people's routines and just their expectations for one another. And I think as a byproduct might be causing more opportunities for misunderstandings and more conflict at home, which is what we really deal with in family therapy. So one thing that I found to be extra helpful for families right now, um, which is related to good communication is becoming better active listeners with each other. And as it sounds, active listening just involves you know, present, being present and actively listening to someone when they're sharing with you. Can you give us an example? Yeah, definitely. So we, when we teach active listening to families, we highlight a couple things that you have to do, which is giving good nonverbal cues that you're listening, like um, nodding and giving good eye contact, um, asking clarifying questions, and then paraphrasing back what that person has said to make sure that you've understood it correctly. And you want to do all of that before you give your side of things or try to problem solve or rebut what's being said. Um, because really at a higher emotional level, active listening involves understanding and really validating the other person's experience so that you avoid those feelings of being misunderstood or unappreciated um, or manage someone's frustration or even like address their sense of isolation if they're oh, not being really listened to. Yeah. That's terrific. Terrific. Active listening. That's a real good one. Um, Glenna, do you have a tip from a, um, for emerging more resilient? Absolutely. 
Um, I think this is a great question. I also, I love what you said about active listening, Megan. Someone told me once, like, if you're thinking about what you're going to say in response, then you're not listening. And I always, I, that like really resonated with me as someone whose job it is to listen. And I, I always share that with, with patients and families too. Um, but my sort of strategy is to stay connected and stay creative, stay creative about the way you connect with people. I have had families do virtual vacations to Japan where they did a sushi making class and visited a museum virtually. And I have had patients do sort of synchronized movie nights across the globe with their friends. And I got to participate in a virtual dance class with my six-year-old niece in the Midwest. And combating the sensation of isolation can be a huge piece of mental wellness. We know that. And that's true whether we're in a global pandemic or not. So let's not lose what we learned about how we can stay connected to each other in sort of traditional and non-traditional ways, you know, when things are really hard or or when they get a little bit better. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Cassidy, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I love what everyone has said so far. And I think I'm going to call this becoming an emotion detective um, <laughs> because during this time, you know, where fear and anger and sadness or anxiety, all these different feelings are heightened, understandably. Um, those are states where we can't always tend to function at our best or think our best. And so to piggyback off of what Megan said, you know, I think active listening is great. We also have to know what we want to say and what we want people to listen to. And so becoming an emotion detective on ourselves can be really helpful. Um, and what I mean by this in our clinic, um, we actually use colors instead of words because it creates like a universal language that the whole family can work with. So for example, green would be where your calm and happy places and red zone might be when you're really angry or scared or overwhelmed and where you're really not at the place where active listening is even going to work. <laughs> right. And so I find, you know, even in my own house, you know, with my husband, I might say, Hey, hun, I'm in the red zone. I don't say it that nicely. I'm in the red zone <laughs> and I need a timeout. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the red zone right now, so I need a break and we can come back to talk about this later, but that's where I'm at. And hopefully he's using active listening at that point <laughs> to hear my words and, and we take a break, right? And so I think if everyone can kind of tap into themselves a little bit more so that they actually know what they're feeling, because with kids, oftentimes we find identifying what they feel is the very first step. Right. And sometimes they don't even have the vocabulary for it yet. Like they don't know how they feel and they'll tell you. Sometimes they say I'm really bored when they really mean that they're feeling sad and lonely. So clarifying and becoming that detective of your emotions, um, which is really hard. I, I think I would hope everyone would take away from today. Um, in the follow up from the salon, we're going to distribute to everyone who's watching today and those who didn't these tips so you can have them on a sheet to take home for you and your family. Um, now we're gonna turn to my favorite part of the afternoon, Cassidy. Um, we're going to meet Cassidy's former patient, Camille, and I'm just so excited that she's willing to share her journey with us. So Cassidy, if you would introduce Camille, um, I think everyone will be really looking forward to meeting her. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you so much. So I'm really excited to introduce Camille and I, I know her, her parents, I think are on right now too. So I'm so grateful to them for, you know, opening up and, and really her bravery at sharing with you guys this afternoon. Um, and, you know, Camille is someone I had the pleasure of getting to meet almost two years ago now. So when you talk about continuity of care, um, I got to meet her when she was experiencing some anxiety and depression, which she'll talk about and, you know, really dive into family therapy with them and, and work with them um, both prior to and after a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And she will go into more detail herself in her own words about that. Um, I think that, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, you mentioned hope earlier, Lori, and I think one of the benefits of working with youth is that they really provide a lot of hope themselves, right? Seeing how resilient they are and 
you know, now with my three month old, that helps me as well. But Camille is really one of those examples for me of increasing my hopefulness and how, you know, the patients we have often teach us when we're trying to teach them. And she has shown me that, you know, children and teens can do hard things. I think often as providers or parents, we feel like we need to, you know, do more for the kids and save them or fix them when really time and time again, I am amazed how much youth can get through, whether it's a simple homework assignment I give them or going through a hospitalization and then still graduating high school on time. Like they are absolutely incredible. So I'm going to stop talking now to let Camille take this away um, in her own words. And and I'm just really grateful for them for, for sharing tonight. Hello, my name is Camille and I am a senior in high school. I'm very honored to be speaking about my experience with the Max Gray CHAMPS program. At the age of 15, I was struggling with anxiety and depression and was showing signs of a mood disorder. So I was referred to the Max Gray CHAMPS clinic for family therapy. At the time, I was very shy and I didn't express my feelings to anyone, especially not to my parents. I didn't want to accept the fact that I needed help. In my mind, my family was the problem. During my sessions with Dr. Zanko, I realized that the way my family communicated was the real problem. We would yell and argue with one another. But family therapy taught us communication skills, including active listening, problem solving, and expressing negative feelings. Our home life improved over time because of this. But unfortunately, at age 16, I was hospitalized for a manic episode and diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The diagnosis was very difficult for me to accept and to process. I did not want to be labeled with a mental illness that could sometimes be negatively perceived by others. It was also my junior year in high school, and I was worried I would not be able to finish this very crucial year. Dr. Zanko recommended that my parents and I do family therapy for a second time. Only this time around, we had a clear diagnosis. We focused on my bipolar disorder and keeping my mood stable. The therapy helped me to learn more about my condition. And I learned the importance of taking medications daily, exercising to be healthy, and sleeping at least eight hours every night. In time, I came to accept my diagnosis. I was able to share my condition even with my closest friends who embraced me with acceptance and no judgment whatsoever. When I first started family therapy, I was reserved and unwilling to open up. When I came out of family therapy, I was confident and able to express myself. Family therapy helped me in every aspect of life. I was able to use the skills I learned to develop and maintain my friendships, gain motivation in school, and develop a better relationship with my own parents. Recently, I found a journal entry of mine from when I was first discharged from the hospital. I wrote, I feel like I will never make it to college or even get a job. I'm honestly scared that I will die after high school because I won't know how to handle myself. Family therapy helped me to change my state of mind completely. I started to believe in myself and realized my condition would not stop me from doing what I wanted to do in my life. I never thought I would be where I am today. I'm about to graduate with the highest marks in my high school career. I have a part-time job in social media and marketing. And I have been accepted to eight colleges. I would like to give a big thank you to Dr. Zanko, Dr. Pham, Dr. Sudith, Cheryl, and many others for not only helping me with my mental health, but helping me find who I really am. They helped me realize that with bipolar disorder, I can live a happy, normal life just like anyone else. Thank you for making the Max Gray Fellowship possible. I'm so proud of that work, Cassidy, thank you. Camille, you're an inspiration and thank you for sharing your story and giving us all hope. 
Um, wow, you have such a bright future ahead of you. Oh, that's just wonderful. Um, we all wish you continued success and good luck as you continue your journey. Um, I couldn't be more proud of the work we've done during this challenging time. And I'm thrilled to announce that next year, thanks to all of you and your support, we'll have four Max Gray Fellows again. And I'm delighted to announce that Megan will return for a second year. Uh, we'll be sad to lose everyone else, but we understand and are so grateful for the time you've spent as a Max Gray Fellow. Um, thanks to all of you. Again, I can't thank you enough um, for the financial support um, and to our terrific fellows and for sharing your stories and dedication to this important work. And you've given us all such really helpful takeaways that we can use in our lives. Thank you also to Drs. Gitlin and Miklowitz for their leadership and to our development team who have made today possible. Um, as I sit back now after the sixth, sixth Max Gray Salon, I am speechless. Um, losing a son is an in, an just un, unimaginable loss, but what we're doing and the lives we're saving um, gives me hope and gives me the energy to go forward every day to try to help more people. So for me and for my family um, and for Maxie, I couldn't be more grateful. And um, I'm just so proud of this work we're all doing every day. So thank you. Um, for anyone who would like more information and resources, We've shared the Max Gray Fund website and giving link at the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, everyone who registered will re receive an email with a recording of this event and some helpful tools going forward. If we've tried to answer all of your questions, but we couldn't in the time allotted. So if you have additional questions, please submit them in the Q&A and we will ensure a timely response. Again, thank you all from the bottom of my heart for supporting and joining us. Uh, please stay safe and be well. And we hope that next year we will all be together again. Thank you so much.